Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Rick, for those that don't know me, and my wife is Kathy, and together with Pastor Eric and Reba and a great team, we uh, are happy to worship with you here at All Nations Church. We're so glad you're here today. Uh, We're conscious, as Pastor Eric said, uh, we're that slide there, that video just talked about even in our times of sorrow, and uh, collectively we're grieving for one of our members this week. Uh, Dear friend Ray Duff has gone to be with the Lord and uh, many of you have been praying, and, and Joanne and uh, Ray's son, Sebastian, are in the house today, and uh, our heartfelt condolences to you. We love you. We're grieving with you, and, and we're standing with you in this time of sorrow and this time of loss. So, uh, It's been a difficult week for many people and a good week for uh, some people. Pastor Eric shared that, you know, when he's, he usually does a lot of watering, but on Thursday, God blessed him, and he didn't with the rainfall, he didn't have to water. So that was, a, that was a good thing today. God does things that surprises us all the times. And other times, we don't understand what is happening. But I, I appreciate what Sarah said. There is faith in the room today that, um, that we don't always know what's going on. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. forever. And whether we see what he's doing or not, he is still faithful to bring the best about on behalf of his children, the people that love him. So we're grateful for that today. Aren't you grateful for God's goodness? Amen. Amen. Now, you guys were singing like a pretty powerful choir today. Like, you know, was there somebody around you singing real good? Turn and give them a high five right now. Say, you were singing great today. Come on, give them a high five. There wasn't somebody singing not too good. Still give them a high five today. Okay, don't let on any different. Just give them a high five. Say, we appreciate you being in the house of the Lord and standing in faith as we worship together. It's been a great week. Lots of people have had some great things going on. I've had a very busy week. We've been with the team, Lionheart team up in Fort Chippewan for a second week and uh, very busy up there. Record number of kids. Over 42 different children came through the camp and lots of people dropping in. So we're excited about what God's doing up there. But here, God has been moving and working with people. And uh, But it's been a very busy time. And often uh, times like this when, you know, staff are on vacation and different things are happening, changing of seasons, we sometimes get off of balance. Sometimes our balance is challenged. And uh, my balance has been challenged for a while now. But uh, um, what we're going to deal with today as we talk about uh, the changing world that we live in. And uh, I don't know about you, but if you've ever had times that you say something's, something's uh, off balance here, like uh, some people hold their phone up and say, man, if this phone doesn't be quiet, I'm going to lose my mind, you know, because it's like it's always ringing. It's always taking you off your scheduled tasks or the thing you're trying to do, and it takes you a different direction sometimes. So um, that's life. Life has got ups and downs in it. And there are certain seasons in our life that uh, God gives us grace to work extended periods of time. And that's the way it was in Scripture, too. Like, I mean, our, our world isn't much different in terms of we, we have 24 hours a day. But back in the day of Jesus, there was people spent the majority of their time just in sustaining their life. They'd get up, you know, they would set a fire, they would get water, they would do different things. And uh, here in our time, we are just as busy, but we have technology and wonderful things to help us minimize those things we need to do in terms of sustaining our life. But we tend to get preoccupied and overoccupied with a bunch of other things. Does anybody else agree with me on that? Yeah, life just is always, always, always crowding in. And uh, I read a recent a book recently. I pulled it out, and it was actually 13 years ago. It was Richard Swenson. He was an MD. He was a cardiac specialist, and he was going to take a year sabbatical. And he wrote the book. He said, what can I do for the world in my year sabbatical? So he wrote the book, uh, In Search of Balance. And he did a history of progress in the world. And he, he lays out when the world started to speed up, and we... we Got started to get preoccupied with um, more things and much things and doing more things and doing things faster. And he just talks about the, the history of progress that we are in a point right now that uh, it's greatly affecting our well-being. And so we need to not look very far, but back to the source of truth, back to the source of life, and back to the source of light. And it's the gospel to help us deal with these situations we see in our world right now. Richard said, uh, we live in a world that emphasizes materialism and busyness. We are going at a pace which is increasing and cannot be maintained and keep any type of health or balance. Uh, The real problem, he said, busyness is often how we define success. And now we've stopped even thinking that balance is even possible. And instead, we say, this is the new normal. This is my new reality. 
So as I look at the scripture today, I'm going to challenge us to uh, invite the Holy Spirit to look at our lives and to show us there's any areas that he might want to help us adjust so that we can live more true to him and relationship with him in a life that is more full. Like we said, we love God, we love people, and we love life. And, and we can't be loving life to the best of our ability when we're a slave to time or we're a slave to uh, our pocketbook or our daytimer. So uh, we're going to ask God today to help us uh, see something from Scripture that would help us live a more balanced life, more in the fruit of the, of the Holy Spirit and in the joy of the Lord. Let's take a moment and pray over this message. It's called Only One Thing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today, and I thank you for each and every person here that's listening. I thank you for the faith that's in the room. Holy Spirit, would you just amplify the words of Jesus? Would you help them bear fruit in our lives so that we could experience you more and know you in a greater way? Father, we want our lives to be full of you so that others can see you and come to you and know you, and that your kingdom can advance and your name would be lifted up. Father, that's our prayer. Would you help us with this today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I said before we see busyness surrounding today's story, but um, these women and Jesus give us some hints about how to live a life even in the, in the uncertain, busy times. We're going to look at Luke 10, the story of uh, Martha and Mary. How many people know that story, Martha and Mary? Yeah, it's a well-known story. We use it. And uh, let's take a clear look at, at what they said, what the Lord said through this scripture for our for our benefit. The context of Luke 10, there is three stories in Luke 10, three major stories in Luke 10, but what was happening in the ministry of Jesus at this time was the ministry was expanding, okay? He'd spent, he'd already spent some time, a year and a half or so with his 12, rubbing off on them, getting to know them, uh, releasing the kingdom culture to them, letting them understand who he was and what he was about and what they were about to do. And he sent the 12 disciples, or the apostles out, and then they came back and they said, oh, Jesus, this didn't work or that didn't work. And he mentored them and coached them through these, uh, these their, you know, educational tours. Well, this time in this story is when he sent the 70 disciples out. So these were 70 followers. He was in a period of expanded outreach. So we see that he was sending more people out with the message of the kingdom of God, and he was coaching them and sending them out. He gave them instructions what to do, what not to do. Just go and trust in me that my spirit will be with you and the Father will be with you. So that's the context. It's very busy. People are coming, going, everything, and Jesus is mentoring these masses. of people. Just think of starting a great big business, and it's launch day, or it's, you know, you know, two months in and everything's still, all the systems still aren't working well and it's going crazy. Or think of turnaround at that site, you know. There's all sorts of different things going and although it's well planned, it's an happen happening, things change and you have to move. So it's a busy, busy, busy time. So the first story we see at Luke 1 to 10, 1 to 24, he sent them out as ambassadors. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he's sending them out as ambassadors of the kingdom, say, there's something going on here. There's so many people that want God. There's so many people seeking for God, but they need workers. And he said, you go and you be an ambassador of my kingdom. He said, you're not going to do it like the former religious leaders did. You're not going to do it with a message of condemnation and condescension and things like that. You're going to go as neighbors. And we hear the story of, of the... Uh, the great commandment. They said, Jesus, what is the great commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he added this other dimension and love your neighbor as yourself. So he qualified, this is the way you're going to go out in the midst of this busy time. You're going to love people. You're going to care for people. Who's my neighbor? It's anybody who needs your help is basically what Jesus said as love motivates and drives our life. And so now we're picking up the story that we're going to concentrate on today, and it's Luke 10, 32 to 40, uh, 38 to 42, and it was in the midst of this expanding, busy ministry. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the, one, by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. 
So here we see this time that uh, they were there, and uh, Jesus and his disciples were coming up that long road. They were a couple miles out of Jerusalem, but they thought they'd stop at, at a house of Martha and Mary. Now, there's something we need to recognize. We're going to look at Mary and Martha, and they're both their responses in this situation. Martha was considered a worker. Everybody, you hear the story of Martha and Mary. How many people say, yeah, Martha was the one too busy. She was busy working and never spending time with Jesus. And I think sometimes Martha gets a bad rap because... Um, she was seen as working, and uh, she was actually doing what religious tradition told her to do. When somebody came to your house, there was clear protocols of what people needed to do with somebody that came to your house as a guest. You would generally anoint their head with oil, you would wash their feet, you would get them something to eat, and you would comfort them. If there was a stranger in your midst, you would make sure they were well looked after because they were remembering that we too were once people wandering as strangers in the wilderness with nobody to look after us. So Martha was doing what she was to do. But what I think was happening here, and Jesus pointed out, that was she was just kind of going a little overboard. How many people go overboard sometimes when people come to your house for lunch? Yeah, we, lo we love to have a meal, a big meal sometimes. We believe that the kingdom of God is a party and there's celebration. And if there's one turkey, then there should be a ham and there should be salads and there should be desserts and more desserts and more desserts. And, and um, you know, we believe that's what it is. And so this is what she was doing. But in the midst of her toil, she failed to discern where Jesus was in this picture. She was so busy working, do it what she knew to do, that she failed to pull back and, and say that there's more going on in this room than what's happening in my realm. And so she went to Jesus. She appealed to his sense of righteousness and fairness, which was a big principle in Judaism. Fair, just, righteous is a big deal. So she said, Jesus, this is not fair. My little sister is sitting around doing all the work. Any little sisters in the room ever said that? I'm, a, you know, any big brothers in the room, you know? I, this isn't fair. And Jesus said, look, it, she has done the right thing. She is sitting. So he didn't really rebuke her, but he said, there's something better than what you were doing. And it's important for us to recognize that. So um, she was responsible. You can imagine Jesus showing up, right? Jesus showed up, much like some of the husbands in the room might show up, you know? You come and... Uh, Come in home. Hey, honey, I'm home. She says, okay, wash up. The dinner's just about ready. Oh, and by the way, I've got 15 friends from the golf course with me. You can imagine how well that would go over. Has anybody ever had that happen in your life? Yeah, so this is what happened. So Martha was stressed trying to do what she knew to do very well. And, and I think it's, it's honorable, and we, we sometimes give her a bad rap, but we need to honor her that she was working hard for the Lord and for the ministry that was presenting itself around her. But she did seem kind of afraid to slow down. And I, I think there's some principles for us in here and uh, we should kind of look at. She might have thought, as I said before, uh, she might have thought that people saw her as not doing her job. And sometimes we get out of balance and we do all these extra things because we're very aware of what people are thinking of us and what people are looking at us. And we compare ourselves to other people. And when we get to do that, you start focus more on what they might be thinking of you and not what you know to do or what you know the Lord has confirmed for you to do. So it's very important for us to, to find balance to make sure we're doing what the Lord has told us to do, not what we think others are expecting of us all the time. Now, God does put people around us that will help us and help us confirm where, where we're, what we're doing and how we're doing it. But to just go off and do a bunch of things without confirming with the Lord could be pushing us into an area of unbalance. I know that's happened for me lots of times. Um, I guess she didn't realize enough was enough. Sometimes a, a tuna sandwich and, a, and a, you know, a bowl of tomato soup is better than the big fancy turkey. I had somebody in the first service say, he turned over to his wife and said, we got any tuna at home? That's what we're going to have. <laughs> they went home. He's at home right now having tuna and tomato soup. Anyways, so she compared herself with others, and she also started to get in a pity party. How many people have had a pity party? Don't put your hands up. But, but we do, right? We start thinking, you know, I'm doing all this work, and, and, and nobody else is doing anything, and it's just not healthy. So we need to just continue to go before the Lord, be honest, and say, God, what am I to be doing here? And he will show you, and he'll lead us, and he'll help correct the things that we need to uh, do. We don't want to be trying to please someone else. Um, we need to recognize that work is a blessing from God, uh, but if we're motivated 
by anything other than the Spirit of God or the principles of Scripture that he's taught us to live by, then we can get into vanity and we can get into, you know, pride. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. And uh, so Warren Wiersbe said, what we do with Jesus is much more important than what we do for him. So we need to recognize and judge everything, whatever we're doing. Are we doing it with the Lord or are we just in our own energy and own strength trying to do something to please him, but maybe something that he has not asked us to do? So I've identified when I read the scripture, I'm a Martha. You can decide yourself of a Martha. God is giving us grace today to maybe relook at our schedules, relook at some of the activities we're involved in, and maybe there's some adjustments to be made. He loves us, and he will remind us. He will he'll kind of say, hey, Rick, you might want to check this out. So take this message as, as a time of grace that God will help us come back into balance and maybe adjust some things we need to adjust, okay? Um, some of the practices that help us get into balance regarding our work. First, we must choose to value God's word over our work. What does he say to do? Make sure we're focused on that. Choose to stop comparing ourselves and striving for man's approval. Um, you know, we are responsible to God for what he's told us to do. We don't have to look at whatever somebody else has got, what somebody else is doing. What's he telling us to do? Be faithful in that area. Stop chasing unrealistic expectations of yourself. I've seen people put such high expectations on themselves that they cannot possibly meet and go into depression and go into a downward spiral and, and uh, spiral in difficult times, up and down, up and down, up and down, because they expect more from them than God expects of them. And I've seen certain cultures, certain nationalities, you know, they're uh, often expecting the highest, and there's sometimes not the mental capacity to be all these high-functioning, high-capacity roles. What does God have for us? Sit at his feet, discern what that is, and move into that. That's the place of contentment. That's the place of balance. That's the place of joy. All right? Stop chasing unrealistic expectations of yourself. And learn to say no. How many people have a hard time saying no? You don't have to put your hand up. <laughs> yeah, we all do because we, we're Canadians, right? We like to bless people. We like to be nice to people. And uh, sometimes we have a hard time saying no and, uh, it, or learning how to say no. And uh, it's, it's something we have to work at our entire life, our entire life. And forgive me if I've asked you to do too many things. Uh, you know, if I ask you to do something, and I'll, I'll try to qualify it with, um, have you got time to do this? Do you really want to do this? You know, some guys, I'll say, are you sure you want to do that? I'll ask you the next day so that I don't, you don't feel pressured into doing something. But learn to say no. So that was kind of Martha. Oh, here's a looking at uh, Mary. And Mary was considered a worshiper. And this, this encounter that we're talking about was the first of three major encounters that Mary had. The second encounter was at the tomb of Lazarus, her brother. The third encounter was one we've already, a story we already told about her at the feet of Jesus just before um, he was taken and tried, and she poured out uh, the expensive perfume on his feet. This is the first major encounter, and here she is at the feet of Jesus. And it's funny, every one of the other encounters, there she was at the feet of Jesus. She was a worshiper first. She learned who Jesus was, and she became a worshiper. Um, this was not Mary sitting at his feet asking for something. It was not Mary giving him something. This was Mary just sitting and waiting. Uh, Luke 10, 42 says, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary learned to sit at the feet of Jesus and discover who he was. It's a process. It takes time. There are times that God will give us a divine revelation and break us through in an area, but a lot of this is relationship building. As you, as you glean from his word, spend time in his word, when you spend time in prayer, when you spend time in worship, when you spend time encouraging other believers, you glean the truth of God's word and begin to own it for yourself. There's a group of uh, chiefs right now from Saskatchewan on their way to meet a delegation of Holocaust survivors over in Israel. And they're going there to sit at the feet of the Jewish people and say, we need to learn from you how you survived the, the um, genocide of your people back in the Second World War. How, how did you, you survive that period of time? And so the First Nations people are recognizing they've been through significant trauma, but they're recognizing the Jewish people are coming through with a degree of success and a degree of national identity and strength and, and 
cultural significance. So they say, we want to learn this. So they're going to sit at their feet. They're going to spend time with them and glean from them. They said, we don't know how long we're going. We don't know if it's going to be two weeks, two months, but we're going to sit and glean. That's what Jesus is talking about us. That's what he's encouraging us from the scripture. Can we find time to recalibrate, to reorganize our lives, to sit at the feet of Jesus and let him re- reveal himself to us and reveal us to us? That's one of the greatest things he would do, right? So uh, Mary took time to sit and discover Jesus, to know him and to know herself. There we see, you know, a couple chapters later, um, she's at the feet of Jesus again when her brother died. And the brother had been dead four days. And when Mary heard, she was at home. And when she heard that Jesus was coming, she ran to him. And she jumped down at his feet and said, Jesus, had you only been here, my brother would not have died. And Scripture says that Jesus was actually, he was moved. He saw her weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. She got to that place of faith. She got to that place of moving because she'd spent time in intimacy with Christ. And God, this was a, a creative, this was a miracle that he did. And uh, we don't know when he's going to do a miracle like that or not do a miracle like that. We, are, we know from Scripture we're always to call upon God's intervention and the greatest outcome. And so regardless of what the circumstances look like in any situation, we are right to call on God to bring a miracle and bring complete restoration regardless of what we see. Amen? So as we begin to uh, sit at the feet of Jesus, and I believe that there's dead things in our lives, there's dead things in our relationships that could come back to life. God could show us wisdom. He could show us uh, clarity on how we need to operate or cooperate in a way that brings things that were once alive and now dead back to life. And I believe that for your life today. When we come to the prayer room up here, if there's something you need prayer for, we are going to believe for the fullness of God for you. And that comes from sitting at the feet of Jesus, knowing his truth, knowing his word, and uh, then walking in his grace. Um, I didn't tell this story before, but I did met a couple in, in Nanaimo, B.C. We took a tour of, grand, of kids, grandkids, took a tour of youth group there years ago, and we had an open-air meeting in Nanaimo, the witchcraft capital of Canada. And it was crazy, crazy meeting. We were in this big park outside of an Anglican church, and uh, we were there all day long. We were worshiping, we were praying, we were doing intercession. And there was a witch's coven really close to us, and they were walking around like this. They'd stolen some Bibles. It was like a really powerful time. The minister, that night we came to minister, and we were in a worship meeting for about, about five full hours, five to six hours. And as we worshiped there, the minister says to me, there's a couple here that are from our church, but they've been separated for a long time, for like, you know, a long time, over a year. And uh, they're now at this worship service. And as they sat there over the entire night, all of a sudden, we see this couple together. And they're sitting together, and they're communicating. They're totally oblivious to anything God's doing or we're doing, but they're sitting there engaging one another again. And sure enough, at the end of the night, it came. We cleaned up the park. We took, tore everything down, about to switch the lights up, and there's that couple still sitting on the blanket. And uh, somebody said, well, should we tell them to leave? I said, no, heck no. They've been apart for over a year. Let's let, turn the lights off. Leave them on their own. Let, like, let them stay. But God will do tremendous things, and he will bring things back to life in our lives if we trust him, if we reach out to him, if we call him. He'll help us with that. So we want to stay balanced in in busy times. This is uh, some of the things we see from the life of Mary. Be intentional. Make time to discover Jesus. Are you intentional? Do you have a time in your busy schedule uh, that you make time to sit aside, sit alone with God? I know life is crazy, it's busy, especially if your mom's with kids and big jobs, and it's very, very difficult. But if you're intentional about trying to find that pocket of time you can sit beside the Lord, he will help you with the grace to to set that time aside somewhere. He will meet you because he's faithful, okay? Be intentional, make time to discover Jesus, okay? Um, Jesus did this, it was a habit of his, you know, he was a single man. It was a lot easier for him to do that, but he it was a habit. You see all throughout Scripture, up all day long, working, serving, caring for people, first thing the next morning, while it was dark, off to a solitary place. We can do it. That's what was modeled. That's what he's encouraging, okay? As we do, we'll see his plans. We'll see some of our hurts uh, 
uh, dissipate. We'll see our disappointments and frustration. We'll get wisdom for them. We'll begin to let them go. When we spend time with the Lord, he gives us the grace to heal and recover from those difficulties of our past. We're excited about uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting coming up starting the 14th of August. And we're going to meet here every morning, 6.30 to 7.30. And we are going to have a time of worship, not a real time of worship. There'll be worship music on. But we'll be praying and we'll be uh, getting together and, and seeking God. And this is a good time. You might want to try to do that. If you've never done that, come and join us. We'll be giving out some Bible studies uh, that you can follow along with us in the prayer journey. Uh, we'll give it a little study about understanding fasting. If you've never fasted, we'll, we'll show you what that means and, and help you kind of learn to do that. And God will meet you in that time that you set aside to meet him. So that's coming up. You'll hear more about that really soon. So you're going to set intentional, make time to discover Jesus. Number two, choose the simple life and be content. Now, I know I'm always running here and there and everywhere, and we often are. But you know what? If we can learn and just do less, less is more. And sometimes with our children, come into September, there'll be piano, there'll be uh, basketball, there'll be volleyball, there'll be this, there'll be that, the other thing. And, you know, maybe, maybe we need to drop one or two of those activities. And it might be more peaceful for your home, for your kids, for everybody. Just ask the Lord if there's some way you can simplify your life. And he'll show you if that's something uh, he's going to help you do, all right? Choose the simple life and be content. Um, Mary, she defined and defended her boundaries, all right? She said uh, she was in there, and I can't imagine that Martha didn't ask her once. So I'm speculating. It doesn't say it in the scripture, but uh, you would think, and it's quite likely, that Martha was trying to get Mary out of that room to help her with all the chores. And it's, she said no. She just sat there, and finally Jesus spoke up and said, no, she's chosen the best thing, Okay. Really important to define your boundaries, what you can do, what you can't do. There's times in your week you have to guard, guard your time. Very, very important that we learn to do that. And I am talking to me, first and foremost. I've got this 50 times, and my beautiful wife is just sitting very gently, nodding and saying, yes, 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 Lord, help him with that. So um, Mary discovered it. She defined it. She was spending time with him, and she defended it. She wasn't going to move off that. Very, very important, okay? She learned how to say no, and I said that before. I'll say it again. How do we learn to do that? Lord, help us with that. I know it's a challenge for me, and it might be a challenge for others. So our 21 day of prayer and fasting um, is coming up. You might want to participate in that. How many people would describe yourself as one of those, like you're probably see yourself leaning on a Martha side or a Mary side. And it's important to recognize that not one isn't necessarily better than the other. I mean, we favor Mary because God says she's chosen the best thing. But we can't discount that Martha was serving the Lord. She was doing all she could do to serve the Lord. But she maybe slipped into her own self-effort and a little less of just doing it with the Lord. So, you know, we don't want to give her a bad time, but you might be a Martha today, you might be a Mary today, and maybe there's a little bit of the other side that you want to ask God to give you grace for. You know, one isn't necessarily better than the other one, but uh, we recognize that there's balance is key, right? Um, there's no judgment here for us. The Father is calling for us, though, to return to him, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, Zechariah 1.3. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, said Matthew. There's only one thing, Jesus said, worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. That was her relationship with Jesus. How's your relationship with Jesus today? Like me, kind of strained at times? Oh, you're a pastor. How can you be strained? Yeah, I can be strained, busy doing too many things and not sitting being intimate with my Lord. So you know, no judgment today. He's just saying, come back. I love you. I love you. I want to bring you into that deeper intimacy. I want to bring you back into that fellowship, and you'll experience me and discover me in a way you've never discovered me before. In a minute, I'm going to give you a chance to make a confession of faith and say, I would want Jesus in my life. But first, I'll tell you the story of a lady that uh, we met this past week, and she was a lady that went to the residential school and in Fort Chippewan, and for some reason, um, not necessarily just the school situation, but her life was 
having difficult times. She was having some challenges, some challenges with her children, some challenges with personal things. And she came to the property, and the kids were had a fire on, and they were there out there. And I just sat over in the field looking at an old garden. And she sat, and she wept, and she wept, and she wept. And she said, I'm terribly suicidal. I've been on suicide watch for a long time. And she says, I'm, I'm really struggling with this desire to kill myself. And uh, so we talked, and we listened, and we talked, and we listened. And finally, she was open to prayer. She said, yes, pray for me. And she said, I sense the peace of God. This place used to bring bad feelings to me, but I now sense the peace of God. And she yielded her heart to Jesus. And you could see her countenance change. Then she didn't want to leave. Eh? She wanted to stay all night and talk all night. And I'm still saying, oh, Lord, please, I need some sleep. She wanted to talk all night because Jesus touched her life. The most intimate, deep, broken disappointed part of her life that she thought was untouchable, that she thought nothing up for this many, many years had ever helped her. She opened her heart one more time to Jesus' touch, and Jesus touched her, and instantly her countenance changed, and her heart changed. She says, I feel hope, I feel peace, I feel better, and that's what Jesus likes to do for us. There may be an area of your life right now that you have said, I just can't I don't want to let God in that part, or I've tried too many times and I haven't seen the results. Ask him again into that part that you think smells, that part that's so disgusting, that part that you're fearful to let anybody see or know. Let him into that part because he'll touch it. He'll heal it. He'll restore it. He'll redeem it. He'll use that to declare the good news of God to other people. Please bow your head and we'll give people a private moment just to reach out to God. The count of three, I just want you to put your hand up. If you've never asked Jesus into your life to be your friend, to be your redeemer, just put your hand up. One, two, three. Put your hand up if you'd like to invite him. Yep, I see your hands. Yep, I see your hand. Ask Jesus to come and be with you. That's wonderful. You can put them down now. Everybody, will you just pray with me together? Nice, strong prayers. Heavenly Father. Thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin, and to help us discover Jesus. I believe in him. I trust in him with my life. Holy Spirit, lead me in the way you want me to go and completely redeem me for God's sake. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's give it up for those people that made a decision right now. Come on now, give them a big, yeah, yeah. So good, so good. Well, all nations, uh, you know, we've got a great opportunity coming up. Whether you're a worshiper or you're a worker, it doesn't matter. God wants to use us to to, uh, help people around us. And we have a season of life groups starting in September. We've got this prayer time coming in August. September, we launch life groups. Man, I encourage you to jump in one and help help. Be a blessing to somebody. Encourage somebody. Maybe you can share the word of God. Maybe your story will help other people learn to walk in freedom. Could you just pray and see if God wants you to be part of one of those? I know we would love to have you, and you will be a blessing to others, and you'll be blessed as well. Can I just reach out right now and uh, and, uh, pray a benediction over you? May God open your eyes to see the true value of your time and how deeply he cherishes when you choose to spend it on him. May your dedication and passion for others move Jesus with compassion. May your experience, may you experience the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit in every area of your life, spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks. This day to sing all of my fear. And all of my fear.